नमस्कार अकील जी वेलकम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर मेकिंग टाइम very nice to see you after so long ji bahut acha lag raha hai uh, so like with everyone else can we start with hearing your reflections or your memories of the earliest recollection i mean how does even the notion of ahimsa enter your life when you were growing up in india you know rajni i i uh... I grew up in a relatively anglicized home and uh you know it was a secular muslim home so ahimsa as a as a concept you know as a gandhian concept uh didn't surface very much in in my upbringing at all and uh <clears throat> it was in, in fact it's a, it's a very interesting thing that when i was growing up and and i believe this must be true of most secular muslim urban uh families <clears throat> that their real hero was jawaharlal not gandhi uh you see because jawaharlal stood for a kind of uh secularism and jawaharlal spoke urdu and you know i mean it was so so nehru was you know we were brought up to to love nehru at home as if he was an elderly member of our own family nehru uh, chacha nehru ha huh. and, and and you know my father called him pandit ji and and uh, <clears throat> and he was <clears throat> the person we really uh, had affection for and gandhi was a much respected figure but he was he was not a loved figure he was not he was rather remote figure for for us uh and um and i think this is this is probably true of most families like mine uh, muslim but but uh but english educated metropolitan uh muslims and and it's only much later when i was beginning to to think about uh gandhi that uh when i before i wrote my first article on on gandhi which was in the 90s uh, uh <clears throat> in the early 90s when i first began to think of gandhi i was 40 years old um i realized how much deeper a thinker gandhi was than nehru i mean nehru was nehru was a remarkable person he was he was very educated and and um, and what was a man of ideas uh but he wasn't an original thinker and he wasn't and he wasn't a profound thinker he he had ideas from from um, uh fabian uh english intellectuals and and you know basically liberal uh socialist thought and uh and it that was my upbringing it it was uh so so non violence and 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 gandhian thinking was relatively absent from my horizon until i began to think think about gandhi myself um and and then it came as a big surprise in fact it came as something that i felt very bad about because i realized that nehru was by comparison quite a shallow thinker and uh and so i really began to think about non violence only after reading gandhi um you know in school i i, I was i was uh by temperament non violent because because there were very violent british people around me in school but but i was a puny kid and so you know i had no option but to be uh, non violent and and to to cultivate sort of verbal resistance to to that brutishness uh but it was purely verbal it was not self consciously non violent or anything like that what is interesting in your question is that when i was in bombay and going to college uh i still had not re- i had all the leftist prejudices against gandhi all of them you know i was i was ve- uh you know i was very influenced by uh uh socialist thinkers by marx and in college i was you know uh you know f- 
quite a self-declared Marxist and and was very much caught up with with the communist intellectuals in in the in the communist movement in India and the communist party in India. And we had a kind of, you know, the kind of classic view of, of Gandhi that Namudripad's book, what, what is it called, the Mahatma Indism, had. And we were very critical of Gandhi. We were even critical of Nehru by that time. You know, uh, by the time I was in college, we were very critical of Nehru. We were critical of the, of the five-year plans for not being left enough and, and so on. But what's interesting is, to speak to your question, in college, the person whose influence I came under, in fact, I, I worked with him a little bit on his campaigns in North Bombay, was Krishna Menon. Interesting. Right. So, so I, I became it's something of a chela of Krishna Menon. In fact, one summer, I even went, when I was in college, I even went to Delhi. You know, he used to live across from Tin Murti. Uh, mm -hmm. diagonally across, you know, in the world, there's that circle, no? So he was right. di diagonally across, he lived from there. And he used to bring out a, a, a weekly or fortnightly, I can't remember, called the century. Mm -hmm. And he, he just said, come, I need some help. Uh, and he basically brought it out in the basement, you know, I mean, he did all his editorial work. And, and I think even the printing was uh, happening in the, so I went and spent a summer uh, in Delhi with, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, with my uncle who lived there, who was in the government and uh, my father's brother and worked with Krishna Menon. And Krishna Menon was not really, uh, never talked of nonviolence, but he was a great negotiator for various peace resolutions in the United Nations. So for me, the no version of nonviolence was peace. That's right. Of course, it's very distinct from peace. Yes. Nonviolence is very distinct from peace because peace is very much caught up with, with, uh, uh, with the concept of war, and it's much, very much a matter of negotiation and not a matter of conscience. You see, it's it's uh, because it's part of international relations, and and Menon's entire thinking about peace was very much caught up with international negotiations. Uh, you know, during the Cold War and so on. So peace was a much more central notion for me than nonviolence, partly because of Menon's influence. Uh, and nonviolence is a completely different idea, mm. you know, mm. and you, we can't confuse international relations issues with, yeah. with the moral and political notion of nonviolence. Yes. So, yes, so peace, peace and nonviolence are two distinct things. But even before you uh, became deeply interested in Gandhi, and then I know you've done very serious writing about him, as a philosopher, how do you frame the problem of violence? Uh, and, and as well as the longing for nonviolence, if we were to, you know, sort of locate it in a, a wider frame, because it mm. is an ancient uh, struggle or dynamic. Right. So... It's true that that you know in Gandhi he claims that it comes from our ancient traditions and and uh, but but the way in which Gandhi developed it we just have to admit that even though he kept invoking Hinduism and Hindu traditions and so on there's no doubt that he got a lot of his central ideas from Tolstoy uh, and here you have to really understand the deep links between some of these Slavophile ideas of Tolstoy and even Dostoevsky, uh, but Tolstoy was, was very much more the direct influence uh, on Gandhi, as we know, you know, uh, uh, and if you look at, if you look carefully at, at Tolstoy's great work, uh, uh, The Kingdom of God uh, is Within You, uh, that has detailed, detailed antecedents of what Gandhi was saying. You know, it's tremendous uh, 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 work in, and Gandhi got a lot of his ideas from there <clears throat> and openly acknowledged those uh, ideas. And it is very interesting to me that, that there is this aspect of, 
of anti-Europeanism in Russia, which is part of the Slavophile tradition. Now, much of it was violent, you know, and, and that's the one of the big differences between um, uh, between the legacy of Dostoevsky and the legacy of, of Tolstoy, uh, that some of the, some of the Slavophile uh, tradition, which was very anti-European and was stressing, as it were, Russian Swadeshi, uh, uh, if you like to put it that way, uh, was, uh, had a lot of affinities with what Gandhi was saying. Um, but, but the particular uh, figure in, in uh, uh, Russia that influenced him was, of course, Tolstoy. And, you know, so, so th there is this very fascinating tradition which goes from Dostoevsky and Tolstoy down to Solzhenitsyn, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which is very much appealing to a kind of Russian religiosity, <clears throat> mm. uh, uh, you know, Russian Orthodox religiosity, but though of course Tolstoy's religion was very maverick. Um, and, and Gandhi was of course appealing to Indian religious traditions and they have a lot of affinities because mm. the common target was European civilization for both of them, mm. Mm. for both Gandhi yeah. and Though it's interesting that for Gandhi, the Sermon on the Mount plays a very big role. And I think that's the linking thread between him and Tolstoy, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Gandhi was very uh, in, influenced by the Bible, but, but in a way he was very influenced by the example of Christ. More than the text, you see, yes. The, I mean, the, there's that, certainly that, that, that famous part of the text that he uh, always cites, and it's a remarkable work. I mean, it's just fantastic part uh, of the Bible. In fact, in fact, the New Testament, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the Old Testament is full of wonderful, amusing and uh, hair-raising stories, uh, much like our uh, religious texts uh, uh, in Hinduism. Uh, but the New Testament has remarkable noble sentiments, especially Matthew and Luke, uh, you know, those two gospels in particular. And, uh, and I think Gandhi was very influenced uh, by them, but he'd read, uh, he'd read the life of Christ. Uh, and I think Christ's life was a kind of beacon for him, as he openly said. And, and you're right that in, in those ways, his, his own religion was very maverick. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's so perverse that he calls himself an Orthodox Hindu, uh, you know, Sanatana. <laughs> what is that? I mean, that is just complete failure to understand himself. Uh, because well, he was, I mean, he maybe, was whatever he, whatever he was, he was not orthodox. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I wonder actually if he uses the English word orthodox because what he often says is Sanatani Hindu. That's what I mean. Yeah, so, but so, I, I, I'm not sure if orthodox is the right translation for Sanatani. But he was not Sanatani. He was... Gandhi was part Christian, part Jain, part Buddhist. That's true. You know, That's true. His Gujarati Vaishnavism was, was very remote from Sanatri Hinduism. But isn't that probably what made him so hateable by those who did want to hang on to the either the orthodox or the one-dimensional at any rate? Uh, because true. it is his bringing a message of nonviolence out of the Gita. That's right. It's, uh, that uh, is, is revolutionary, in, isn't it? Would, maybe this is a good time, place where you, maybe I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Right. So, so his, his reading of the Gita is, is about the futility of violence and, and about, it, and it's a very moralistic reading. You know, it's really about, it's the one clear note that he keeps striking again and again in that commentary. And that is the, the idea that you never undertake an action for its consequences. You undertake it for itself, you know, for its own worthiness, for its, yes. uh, and, uh, and I think that, uh, and it is true. And, you know, there's, 
there is, on the other hand, there's an aspect of the Gita that nobody has really noticed, which I believe is a sort of a, it's not exactly psychoanalytical, but it's a personal, I've got this instinct, which I could be wrong, and I hope somebody who writes on him, who, I hope somebody who, who's maybe Rajmohan or somebody should do it, or, or, or Tridip Surud, um, somebody like that, who, who knows, who has a deep, you know, who reads Gujarati and who has a very good, strong sense of their family life, you know. Uh, I can't help feeling uh, that Gandhi was so taken with the Gita because Gandhi had very, very, I mean, his moralism was so intense and so incessant that he was even prepared to sacrifice family for his moral principles. And it, it was an important thing for him that you, if you understand morality, if you understand dharma, if you understand righteous action, not dharma in the sense of religion, but no. in the sense of moral righteous action. That which is right or wrong. Right, right. Um, and coming from conscience and so on. Right? That's right. Coming from personal, uh, then you can even sacrifice your family, mm. you know, and that's what that you know. Th th that's in a way what the Gita is about. It's about you know, families clashing, preparing to kill your family, own family, and so on. You know, um, and and making an enemy of your family for doing the right thing. Yeah. You know, for whatever yeah. the duty for duty but is. Isn't and, uh, so you see. There is in Gandhi this moralistic streak and his preparedness to sacrifice even family. And that's the theme of the Gita. And I can't help feeling that this must have motivated his interest in the Gita. Yeah, yeah. But why, if, haven't, why haven't commentators said that? That I don't know. But would it be fair to say that this, this moralism is not, is not doctrinarian? Its focus is on the larger well-being. Its yes. focus, it's driven by a profound humanism. Uh, but yes. actually, even humanism is the wrong term because it is actually a concern for all sentient beings. Yes, indeed, it is. But, but you see, I would, I would distinguish it. So I agree with you because, you see, one of the things we must understand is that even when he stresses dharma and and um, and as you say, uh, going beyond one's self interest, I believe that for Gandhi it should not be um, it should not be equated with Western ideas of altruism. Right. See, see so when the West criticizes self interest, it it says it's it's coming from or it's leading to uh, a notion of altruism for gandhi it's just what it's just seeing the world as it should be seen which is from a larger point of view than one's own that so for him for him it's literally a matter of cognition it's not a matter of moralism exactly it's, it is it is i mean this this is his religion is that if you see your duty correctly then yourself will not be involved with it. You will just see the right thing to do from the point of view that is larger than your own. So in an ashram, it's from the point of view of everybody in the ashram. Yes. Right? And, yes. and, and this is what... So it, it's not a moralistic critique of self-interest in favor of altruism. It's rather to say, you're getting the world wrong if you see things from your own point of view. So this raises another very fascinating question in my mind. Would it be fair to say that Gandhi is also very rigorously logical in mm. his argumentations? And I highlight here something that Sudhir Chandra brought up in his Ahimsa conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Sudhir shared the story of how Margaret Brooke White meets him probably on the last day. Um, 
she claims it was 30th of january parallel says it was 29th but that's a quibble she met him virtually at the end it's a photo session but she asks him mr gandhi don't you think that after the atom bomb non violence is impossible and he said but on the contrary it is all that is now left in the field right and he's making a logical statement and then he goes on to say uh, she says all oh, well how can that be suppose the bomb were falling just now what would you do how could you know how would you defend yourself he said i wouldn't defend myself i will not run for the shelter i would rather stand outside and look up and pray for the pilot yeah. now this praying for the pilot for many people turns the whole argument into a kind of religious argument um but i think it's very logical am i wrong how do you respond to that well you know what is i think perhaps the way to think of it is that here you can't separate the the religion and the morals from the politics you know it's very important to see that that nonviolence for him is has got it's got the moral side that we've been discussing so far mm. uh which which and it's a religious morals as you you know it's it's dharma based it's it's righteousness etc and and then there is the political side in which you must remember that he really does think that where europe went wrong was that it made soulless institutions two of them right soulless institutions one is the state what he calls soulless machines hmm. right one is the state and one is capital yeah commerce you know the, the commercial the motivation for everything yeah. right um and he fully understood that they, they were they they went together in fact you know he was opposed to nationalism because of of a certain kind of nationalism because it equated capital and state in the modern understanding of of uh, the nation so so now what's important for him is that these are coiled organizational forms of violence that's right right they they are <clears throat> they are systematically structured forms of violence right they are not episodic violence where somebody wields a sword or accidental right it's yeah it's built into the structure exactly good they're not accidental very good so uh and and that's what makes them soulless right so 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 it's very important for him that violence is going to be any violent resistance to the colonial power is going to yield if it's successful is going to yield a modern state you know it's it's so so the means will ref, be reflected in what you achieve i mean what you achieve will be reflected will be reflecting the means that's right right uh so so since he he's against the that form of of achievement the state capital and modernity generally european modernity for india swaraj is the opposite of of that that that's to to have english rule by other means right but as he says in in swaraj um so so non violence for him is is that you need to find a way that doesn't just mimic the violence of the state Yeah. you need a form of resistance that is not what the terrorist movements and so on you know uh in india you know he was i mean he's for all the ways a dialogue with with those people partly you know uh, uh critical of those people so so in that sense i think it's not possible to understand the moralism without linking it with the opposition to the state you see and the, and that is very closely tied to his idea of mass passive resistance or mass satyagraha 
Uh, why is that? Because being a soulless institution, the state can't be reasoned with. Yes, right. You it can't has no reason conscience with. because it has yeah. no conscience. It no has soul, no conscience. No conscience. It has no soul, yeah. So you can't reason with the state. You can't persuade the state because you can only persuade somebody who is capable of, has a soul, who's capable of thinking, who's capable of, of being. Uh, so the only way you can deal with the state is to resist it. But it can't be violent resistance for the reasons that we were just discussing. And that's why you need uh, you need passive resistance. Now, here's a question that I have, and maybe we can talk about it. This doesn't have to just be an interview. I'll, I'll, let me interview you. It is a conversation. So, <laughs> so, so, so let's just, let me think about this, because this is something that I would like to figure out for myself. <clears throat> you see, Machiavelli said once, famously, he was advising the prince, as you know, in that famous work, and, and he made a distinction between fear and love. And Machiavelli says, <clears throat> the ruler always has a choice between getting his people to either fear him or, or love him. And he says of these two emotions, it's better to, to get the people to fear him rather than to love him. Why? Because fear of this sort is given. Just, you know, fear comes upon you. It wells up in you. And, and so you have no autonomy. Whereas love is freely given. And he says, you don't want to give people autonomy. And so you shouldn't make them love you because the love will have to come from their, cho their choices, their autonomy. Right. And you don't and giving the people autonomy is is a very dangerous thing. So it's better to make them fear you because fear comes helplessly to them. You know, if they're afraid of you, they're just afraid of you. You know, it doesn't they don't will fear, but they have to give love through their will freely. So he says, don't give them the autonomy that that will that you will be giving them if you make them love you make them fear you instead. Now, here's the question. That's advice to the ruler. Who's advising the people? What advice? See, if you, one way to, to think of Gandhi is that he never advised any ruler, he advised the people. Correct. Right? He, was, he was thinking with the people. Right? He wasn't advising the people in the form of Leninism's vanguard communist party, which was giving them theory from the outside. He was thinking with the people, right? Sure. So, so, sure. so now, now the question is, when one is thinking with the people, let's say call it uh, advice to the people, not advice to the prince, but advice to the people, sh should one tell the people, here are, is a choice, should we get the state to love you or to fear you. And, and the point is that the state being soulless will never love you, right? So the question is, can you make the state fear you, right? And mass satyagraha is the idea that you get the state. You see, because you're never going to persuade you're never going through, through rational persuasion, through love or anything. You're not going to convince the state because the state is not that sort of thing. It is to misunderstand the nature of the state, to think you could reason, persuade, you know, uh, stand in those soulful relations with the state. So now the question is, is the point of, it's just a question. I'm not saying Gandhi said this. It's just a no. question. Yeah. Is, the, is the point of the state, is the point of, of, of mass movements that he, I mean, it, it was his genius to mobilize the masses. Nobody had done that. I mean, it was remarkable. You know, you, 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 you start walking with eight people 
and there are you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people joining you on the way you know nobody had done anything like that it was just an amazing thing and and the question is was the point of these mass mobilizations to make the state fearful and is that what we have learned you know so right to this day chomsky talks of mass movements and 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 so on and on the i don't know how to think about it because i think gandhi would have found the very concept of fear a very alienating emotion and, indeed indeed and, and so it yeah. couldn't be that he thought of mass movements as generating fear in the state no he doesn't so, he doesn't so we have to find the right interpretation he's not just he's not just reversing machiavelli right uh, advising the same thing to 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 the people as machiavelli was advising the ruler no. it's something else he's doing but so this much he agrees with machiavelli you're never going you know the, the it can't be reason love all those things you can't do that with the state it's not the kind of thing you could do it with so the question is if it's not fear yeah what is what is the point of mass resistance so uh, at present uh, say in my exploration of non violence after gandhi because that's actually the journey i'm on this Good. this series is is a is one moment long moment two years but it's still one moment in that long journey Uh, i am finding that there is a definite fork in the road mm-hmm. uh gandhi's basic assumption seems to be that you can persuade your opponent even mm-hmm. when the opponent was an imperial state that was mm-hmm. not subject to our democratic uh <clears throat> participation etc um and uh that very much feeds into his emphasis on and his need to fast as a way of being more closely in touch with his own inner responses to the suffering that he was seeing around him um but, the, but fast is not a rational method fast is uh, an well openly... yeah all right so maybe i should not complicate the matter by bringing in the <clears throat> fasting here you're right you're right the fasts do complicate matters uh but what i am emphasizing is that gandhi definitely sees love as moving mountains yes okay an idea which martin luther king then develops with a much more intricate and trainable forms of uh, methodology hmm. right um and we have so many incredibly beautiful stories from the civil rights movement the american civil rights movement right where um this willingness to um suffer yourself uh in the hope that you can evoke love in the other uh, in fact i'll send you the markings on a particular ahimsa conversation uh with a person who was very much part of the civil rights movement he is a quite a big scholar of non violence in america uh david hartsaw he talks about being at a sit in in a in a you know in one of those counters where they were doing protests and facing the guy who want who is planning to stab him the white man the opponent of the civil rights movement um so there is ample living evidence of people who have found in their own life that love can transform the other it can transform individuals right so so it is true that that an individual can can be moved by by nonviolent resistance to so that it doesn't keep it doesn't keep this uh you know it doesn't bring the heavy hand of the state mm. on on you as it would if you were a violent revolutionary so yeah. for instance in the way the irish were in the way that the british did with the irish every time the irish got violent the british state was just brought the entire heavy hand of the state's violence on it this happens in israel all the time and you know yeah. uh uh and 
and so there's no doubt that if they had, uh, if uh, the Palestinians or the Irish had adopted Gandhian methods very early on, they would have they would have probably been tactically much wiser in just the ways that you're describing. And, and uh, that King and, and Gandhi and all uh, had succeeded in doing. But, but it's not really as if, you see, because that is to bypass the structural nature, institutional nature of the state to particular individuals who might just, you know, but it's not obvious to me yeah. that that what, what King and you and, and Gandhi are suggesting here is, is something that then erects the state into, into a rational or soul, as Gandhi would say, soulful yeah. institution. Yeah. It's rather speaking to particular individuals who, who may not, you know. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'll respond to that. I'll respond to that. See, uh, one famous example where what you're saying proved to be the case is the Narmada Bachao Andolan. Okay. Mm. Because the image of Baba Amte with his hands tied with a rope, okay, uh, standing in mute protest uh, and being surrounded by Gujarat police, Medha Patkar with her hands folded and many women offering Jal Samadhi when the waters were rising. All of this did not stop the dam from being built, granted. Um, and yet, um, if you watch Medha's conversation, I'll send that link to you. Mm -hmm. um, she has no regrets. Why? Because she says, and I'm paraphrasing very badly here, that making the point, A, was morally important in itself, and that it did lower the uh, scale of the suffering that otherwise would have been inflicted had even this much um, yes. uh, satyagraha yes. not been offered. So this is one uh, very negative or qualified example. The other examples that, however, are interesting uh, in the positive sense, and they are not really satyagraha in the Gandhian sense, they were more the products of uh, products of democratic politics and democratic policy making. And they are the right to education, the right to food, and the right to information. Mm. All three legislations which were fought for through the late 90s and came to fruition in the early 2000s, uh, it's not that they didn't meet resistance. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is the, this. There's nothing in the. It's not in the interests of the state, state to divulge information, mm -hmm. and uh, the state would have been quite happy to continue with large masses of children remaining uneducated. Um, and yet, those all those things did happen. Um, now, whether the whole implementation story, we won't get into it here. I think we are talking at the formalistic level. What is achievable? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, the issue now is for a lot of people who are part of those movements like Aruna Roy and others, yeah. is that uh, we, were, we were in a sense building upon notions of a, the state having some potential to be benign, if not uh, vaguely benevolent. Yeah, you see, but-, but, but What happens they... now, what happens now- I... When I that promise you. is completely failed. Right. But yeah. I think that, first of all, if you look closely at that period that you're talking about, which is UPA 1, it's in UPA 1 that these food schemes and, and employment schemes were adopted, right? Evan Rager. And, and, okay. Right. Now, UPA, first of all, two points. First of all, the left had real influence on UPA 1. By the time of UPA 2, you know, there was the whole thing that Manmohan Singh and, and his, and his what was that? What's that guy, Montek Singh and, and so on, you know, they had totally sold out to the IMF demands, you know, and all, all right. So while the left had influence, but that's again, the people pressuring the state to adopt. That's right, that's right. right. So that, but that's what I'm saying is what- But it was, the, it was a moral pressure. It was not fear driven. 
No, no, of course it was. Uh, well, that, but that's the question I'm asking. The point is, to what extent is that true? Is it, I, I'm I'm a totally open mind about it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. With it. I'm, 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 you know, I I have no investment in in either either answer being correct. But what I what I want to really understand is, yeah, if they had lost the support of the left at that time, in yeah. UP, it would have been a disaster for them. Right, yeah. so so that you have to see as a kind of fear, you yeah. know. It's a fear in the electoral field, that's but it's true. That's but the true. state. Uh, and that's true. and the other thing is that you can accept the principle and not implement it, which is a typical state move. Yeah, yeah. Right. You know. Yeah. So so in in that sense, I I do believe that it, this is not a question I've resolved. Yeah. I don't believe that Gandhi would have. I agree with you that Gandhi would have insisted that it's a moral pressure, but but fear is the wrong field of emotional force to describe it, and and uh, because it's such an alienating emotion, you know, yeah. and um, I don't think we have theorized enough carefully enough what this field of emotional force no. is over there. And it's yeah, yeah. very well worth doing because Gandhi was not explicit on it, but he yeah. may have said a lot of things which imply what the right position should be. And yeah. I think there's something really to sort out here yeah. uh, for people who, who are trying to get a philosophy out of Gandhi, a political philosophy. Or even, uh, you know, e not limiting it to Gandhi, but uh, addressing the challenges of... Um, uh, nonviolence, not just as an abstract quest, but as as a, a sure. way of life and a way of political action that uh, is possible for uh, us ordinary people. Uh, that sure. I think is the central challenge. So maybe Akil, this is a good place to dwell on what you have written uh, in several places. Um, that while there are many. Uh, many that violence is many sided. Nonviolence is unconditional. Can you elaborate on that, please? Uh, did I say un, did I use the word unconditional, or did I say that it is it is it is undifferentiable? You see what I mean okay. by maybe I got that well, wrong. Please, please right, go ahead but, and clarify. So, I may have so, got it wrong. So what I mean is take take something like violence. So you take something like violence. Now, um, violence there can be there can be um, physical violence. There can be psychological violence. There can be all sorts of. So I mean, if you take a, if you take a novel like Clockwork Orange, maybe you I, maybe you haven't read the novel, but have you seen the movie Clockwork Orange? No, no, sorry. No. Okay, it's a it's it's a, a remarkable novel actually. It's better to read the novel than see the film. But it, it equates, in a, in a funny way, it equates state violence, so sorry, it equates authoritarian violence with delinquent violence. That is, you know, it's, it's looking at a bunch of hooligan kids, right, very violent hooligan kids, and then it's bringing in the authoritarian violence to correct them by means which are manipulative of their of their brains, you know. Uh, so, so it's in a way saying how bad, equating what is bad in in uh, delinquent violence with authoritarian violence. So, when it comes to violence, you have these many different angles, you know, the many different forms of it. Yeah. Physical, psychological, authoritarian, delinquent. You know, there's just whereas the point of nonviolence for Gandhi is. It, it isn't as if you can say there's psychological nonviolence, there's physical nonviolence, there's, you know, it's just nonviolence is a positive philosophy, right? It's, 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 it should be, and it's distinct from peace. Um, and it's, it's just a way of saying, on the one hand, the, uh, that it's just doing duty, religious duty. It's, it's the, for him, it's the one common thing in all religions. In all religions, it's you know there are only one or two common things, but ahimsa is one of them, 
Right. Yeah. All religions, he says, it's the, it's the heart of all religions. Yeah. So he often asks, what is common to all religions? And one answer is that is always there is Ahimsa, right? And so there is a sense in which he, he thinks it's, it's in that sense, not Hindu versions of it. It's just, you know, it's part of dharma, of religious duty, whichever view you take of it, you know, whichever specific orientation, whether it's Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jain, Buddhist, and so on, it's the same thing in yeah. the end, right? And that's what I mean by it being, it, it being that kind of undifferentiated thing, mm -hmm. you know? And, and uh, uh, so for him, it's a negative, which he wants to make into a positive, which is shared by all. It's, yeah. it's shared by all righteous understanding of the world and, mm -hmm. and our place in it and our actions in it and, and so on. So, so I think that's a, 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 a real difference because that otherwise you end up thinking of it as merely opposing violence, but it's a much more positive doctrine than opposition to violence. And in, in that work of mine, I'm very keen to point out that it's connected with truth, with the concept of truth, mm -hmm. and it's connected with the concept of not seeing ethics as a matter of principles, but as a matter of, to see it rather as a matter of conscience. Mm. Yeah. You see, because the, the trouble with seeing ethics as a matter of principles and laws, which is very much part of the tradition that comes from Kant, right. the imperative, the categorical imperative, right? Um, is that when you transgress a law, to use Kant's word, a moral law, or when you transgress a principle or law, then, then you're subject to criticism. Mm. You, you can't mm. be seen as a violator mm. or a transgressor unless you are subject to criticism. But Gandhi thought criticism breeds hostility, mm. you know, and, and so on. So he rather wants to to replace the ethics of principles, which is very Western idea, mm. right? Mm. It's a very Western idea, especially mm. from Kant onwards, from the Enlightenment onwards, right? Mm. That there are these principles, which, which in their technical sense become laws of, of jurisdiction, you know, of mm. uh, 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 juridical, which as you know, in Hint Suraj, he was, you know, he just thought, then it becomes a cesspool of loyally interventions. Mm. And he's against all that, right? Yeah. So he thinks that that debases the idea of justice, morals, etc. right? Mm. Mm. So, so for him, morals should not be a matter of principles, but should be a matter of conscience mm. and acting mm. on your conscience and setting an example. Yeah. Now, yeah. if somebody doesn't follow your example, it's very different from somebody violating a law yeah. or a principle, right? Because part of the disappointment, you see, you don't criticize somebody who doesn't follow your example, you feel disappointed in them. And you partly feel disappointed in yourself that your example didn't take, you know, didn't have uptake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so it's a much weaker set of moral responses than criticism, hostility, anger, mm. contempt, which mm. could lead to violence. Yeah. But to be dis disappointed partly in yourself is not, is not something that breeds violence. Yeah, which you know actually brings us to the most painful question that we are all struggling with just now, uh, when we are seeing the rise of hate-based politics across the world. But I limit myself to India because you're very familiar with, uh, you know, you follow so closely what's happening here. Uh, I mean, in, in ways that no textbook uh, learning could have prepared us, uh, we are struggling with that harsh question. What do you do when uh, there are people who, who don't recognize the call to conscience? who um, actually completely flout any uh, sense of, uh, you know, what to me is elementary common sense. 
Yeah. Um, and by the way, that's happening on all sides uh, at, at, to a point in the sense that, as I keep saying to many of my friends, uh, one thing on there's just one thing that I'm sure of in the moment. And that is that hating the hater is not going to help. Mm-hmm. Right. That is only guaranteed to make the situation worse. It's very difficult. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we are living with that difficulty on a moment to moment basis. Right? I know. When some see, of us have friends who are on 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 murder lists, uh, I have one very close friend who has been living under police protection now for three years. I know. Um, so uh, it's at a personal level, you know, you can do all kinds of meditation and 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 cultivate various kinds of resources internally uh, to to process and wash off that whatever, any response that you feel of hate to hate. But I really don't know what to do when, you know, <laughs> it seems know. like there is no conscience on the other side. But it seems true. Well, you see here, I, I don't know. I just feel that we have to formulate the question here not just in moral terms. You see, I I seem to have, I mean, people have claimed I've influenced them in my reading of Gandhi in that first essay that you, you quoted, that Gandhi was a, a, a non-political or apolitical thinker. I, I disavow any such influence because I did not say that in that essay. I don't know. And, and it's, it's, it sort of wounds me that people have said, as Bilgrami says in that essay, that, that Gandhi was a, not a political. You see, here I, I feel my view about Gandhi on, on the kind of, of nationalistic hatred that you find in India now is that is you have to ask the question, why was Gandhi not a secularist? He was not. Right? Gandhi was not a secularist. Okay, why was he not a secularist? You have to ask the question. And, and the reason is that he thought that secularism was introduced to repair a damage that only had occurred in Europe, but had never occurred in India. Right? What was that damage? <clears throat> you see, in European nationalism, ever since the Westphalian peace, in Europe, a new form of entity had emerged, right? The nation after the Westphalian peace. And a, a new form of, a second form of entity had emerged, which was a centralized state. Prior to the mid, late, late 17th century, Power was scattered in locations, right? Where, uh, was the, the location of power was very scattered and fragmented. It's only with the, with the 17th century, mid 17th century, that you got power getting more and more centralized. Don't forget the first nationwide tax only emerged in, with Cromwell in the interregnum, which is, you know, um, so, so, <clears throat> So you had a new entity called the nation. You had a new entity, which was the centralized state. And no longer could you legitimate state power by the divine right of monarchs, because the rise of the sciences made that a completely unconvincing justification. So how was state, centralized state power legitimized for the people? It couldn't be through theological means anymore. So it was centralized by one method, which is, which is to, to find an external enemy within the national borders and say, the nation belongs to us, not them. Yeah. And because the nation and the state went together, if you created this psychological feeling for the nation, yeah. you legitimize the state because the state and the nation went together. Bilkul. So so this kind of hatred for 
an external enemy within was the basis of state power yeah. in, in nations in Europe. And Gandhi said, this has never happened in India. I mean, yeah. you know, when, when he came back from South Africa, he said, I, I don't see that we need to, so secularism was there to repair that damage of, you know. In Europe. Many, in You're Europe. saying in Europe, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, just think of it, the Jews, the Irish Catholics, I mean, Catholics in Protestant countries, Protestants in Catholic countries, these are the people who were subjugated yeah. in, the, in the name of nationalism, saying the nation is ours, not theirs. Yeah. And this made people, and then there were religious minoritarian backlashes. So then people realize the problem seems to be religion. Yeah. Right? Religious majoritarianism, religious minoritarian backlashes, all this was part of nationalism. Was as a result of nationalism, and so secularism emerged to repair that damage. Yeah. Right, where, where majoritarian religion became the source of saying the nation is ours, not theirs, and then minoritarian backlashes against it gave the impression that religion was the problem, and secularism was introduced to cure that damage, to repair that damage. And Gandhi said. This is their nationalism, it's not ours. Look at what we are doing. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with that. He said, we, we aren't doing that. We've got Muslims in the Khilafat movement. We've got Muslims in the mass contact movement and all that, you know, so we, we are not, we, we are an inclusive nationalism, unlike yeah. Savarkar's nationalism and unlike, you know. Um, even also, some... Akhil, wouldn't it also be that maybe Gandhi is always sensitive to the distinction between mulk, which is my home, and Rashtra, which right. is named. So he's against the, exactly. He's against that idea of Rashtra, right? And he's so he he is all he his view was India has always been an unself conscious pluralism of nationalism. So we don't need we know we, we never had this kind of hatred of of uh, re, between religions and so on. So we don't need secularism to repair the damage. That's right. Okay, now if that is his argument that we are pluralist, unselfconsciously pluralist, we don't need secularism, which only is needed when you have European forms of nationalism, but we don't have that here. Okay, but now, since, since the late 1980s on, we have European nationalism in India. So I, my view is that Gandhi would be the first to say, if he were alive, Look, you've got a constitution. And that's what these kids in the medans and squares were saying two years that's, ago. That's, that's what right. the Muslim, Muslims and all were saying. They were saying, we have a constitution. We we are committed to secularism. Painful, right? So, and, and this would strictly follow because if you lose that unselfconscious pluralism, that's the mimicry of Europe. Yeah. The mimicry of Europe no longer would be to imitate the secularism. Yeah. The, mimicry of, the mimicry of Europe has already come with their nationalism yeah. being recreated by the BJP, right? And, and so there's no avoiding uh, what the kids were, uh, what the kids were just saying, give us secular citizenship. You've got it in the constitution. Yeah. That's what we want, equal citizenship. Right? Which, which is what was being thresh, threatened by the CAA, the NRC, and so on. That's what they were against. So in a sense, I feel you have to ask the question, Gandhi in his time and Gandhi in our time are bound to be very different. Yes. Um, and yet the basic uh, common thread would be his unwavering confidence in the power of love in many forms. Uh, I'm saying this in the sense that uh, I'm here actually relying on Ashish Nandi, uh, who has often pointed out that, of course, terrible things happen over a period of time. Of course, there are spots of violence. One set of people does terrible things to another set of people in some incident somewhere in some century. And then things the, the, the default striving or the default uh, longing for nonviolence and coexistence and cooperation and mutuality and co-creativity, all these things 
reassert themselves, and that is how we got the syncretic culture. But Am I right? Without, not, not without struggle and organization. Of course not. See, well, okay. I don't know. E Samaj, you know, when it happened at the level of society, I think struggle took many very different forms from what we understand it today in the digital age. Well, but 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 think of it this way, na. Uh, what was happening in the in the streets and squares and maidans two winters ago? That's what I mean by struggle. Yes, yes, yes. Today it would mean that I, I'm I'm not doubting that. All I'm saying is that the whole uh, chemical or an organic process of culture formation. Yeah, Which, but I do. I, I think they go hand in hand. I mean, if you look at the farmers' movement, if you look at what happened two winters ago, with, yeah, with with the young, with the youth and the Muslim and Muslim women and so yes. on. Yes, yes. Uh, you see, and you look at what many Dalits have been doing. I mean, Dalits are the ones who showed agency in in a whole period of ten or fifteen years. Or, uh, you know, much yes. more than Muslims. The Muslims went into their shells for a long time until two winters ago. Yes, right. The Muslims from the from basically from from 2005 to 2019, uh, uh, the Muslims were just terrified. They were in a funk, quite right, you know, naturally, what do you expect? I mean, given the kind of brutal uh, treatment they were getting, uh, uh, locking up Muslims without any, legal, you know, I mean, it was just horrible what's been happening. And then to say nothing of the, the kind of, of violence that they constantly meet. So the Muslims went into their shells. The Dalits showed some agency, sometimes even violent agency, as you know, uh, to fight the violence against them. And, uh, and so what I'm saying is that it's not really possible to leave, leave out. So when Aruna Roy and all, I mean, what they're really... I believe what they, they have to be saying is that, that you can't really have Gandhian passive resistance. I mean, Gandhi himself wanted to remove the word passive because he yes. himself was convinced that there was a lot of organization which he made possible. Well, he uh, actually rejects the word passive resistance. Uh, exactly. and, says, and he says that's not what he is for. He is for non-violence, which is uh, right. a much that's more right. uh, richer uh, practice. Right. Right. Go ahead. Sorry. And, go ahead. And Gandhi believed in organization. You see, yeah. you can't you can't get by without organization. Yeah. And in fact, this is partly his fascinating disagreement with Tagore, because Tagore was convinced that somehow Gandhi was falling into the kinds of non-moral political elements uh, through his non-cooperation movement. Yeah. But Gandhi. His repeated response to Tagore was, "You don't understand. We've got to organize. You can't just you can't just take a moral stand." Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and so I would suggest that a good place to explore these questions that we are discussing is to look at the correspondence with Tagore. Yeah, because Tagore accuses him of making things too political. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And he says, you're bringing in the cunning of politics and so on yeah. in your non-cooperation movement. So maybe I'll give you an example of what I had in mind as uh, organic cultural resistance. Uh, I think this is soon after the second uh, election, 2019, I think it was. There was a attempt to present Shirdi Ke Sai Baba as a Muslim saint or a Muslim figure and therefore not to be venerated. It went nowhere. It went nowhere because I, I, I don't know, I have not seen any research on the political inclinations of the hundreds of millions of people who are devoted to Shirdi Ke Sai Baba. I, I mean, within 400 meters of where I'm living, there are two separate shrines and they are very living shrines. Uh, they are neighborhood, community spaces, uh, which I've never really scratched under the surface to see what their party politics is. But that effort went nowhere. And, and I dream yeah. of that kind of 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of but, resistance but a, from within. Yeah, the question is, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, but you see, one way to put your question, here's a way of putting your question. Today, should we, we should ask, so what I've said is that if secularism had a certain genealogy, it was there to repair a certain damage. And Gandhi said that damage has not occurred in India, we don't need secularism. Then given that the damage has occurred in India since the late 1980s, and especially in the last 10 years or more, uh, then would Gandhi say, okay, secularism is fine now because the damage has occurred and you need a repair. Now, here's a way to put your point. No, Gandhi would not say secularism is the right answer to, to repair this damage. Rather, what we need is the doctrine of multiculturalism. That's, right. That's closer to his, his, his admiration for Indian pluralism of, of India's history and India's past than yeah. secularism, right? That's so one way to put your point is this, but why didn't the students go in for multiculturalism? Why did they go in for secularism? And I think the answer is, it's, it's, it's a dream, you know, you can have multiculturalism as, in, as Ashish's idea of love between, you know, different cultures and religions and so or on. Or if not it, love, at least a kind of creative coexistence. Right, creative coexistence. You can, you can have that as a dream. But the fact is that to tell a very large part of the population which has bought into Hindutva nationalism, I don't, it's not just happening in Delhi. I, you know, I, I would take a scooter in Delhi and somebody, I, I mean, I would, I would take a scooter in Hyderabad and I would be speaking to, to some, some, you know, Hindu uh, uh, driver uh, and he would say, ah, Ram Mandir Ban Rai, these are the good days. You know, I mean, it was just in ordinary people's thinking, yes. it had been accepted. It, you yeah. know, the, it, in a way that it had never been until until very recently. So, yeah. so I think that when that has happened, to demand that the Muslims should have the kind of autonomy that multiculturalism, you know, that they should have their own cultures, their own ways of living, their own Sharia laws, and so on, as multiculturalism demand, I think it would never be accepted by the population which as the population thinks now, it may be a distant dream, but right now what the students were doing, I think was absolutely shrewd and sensible. They were saying something is at hand. Those are dreamy ultimate solutions. What is at hand is a constitution which says the the NRC and the CAA are illegal. They're unconstitutional, right? They were saying we've got, We've got a weapon in our hand, a nonviolent constitutional weapon in our hand. And we should be invoking that, secular citizenship. And it was the only workable thing. Yeah. If you and I believe if you want to really get the kind of multiculturalism that you think should be a long-term end, and I'd, I'd be happy to think of it as a long-term end. I don't know if we can do it when when um the only opposition to this government is in the regions. There's no centralized opposition in this government. The Congress is dead in the water. It's, you know, I mean, if the little sparks of revival, it always peters out. There's nothing at the center. All the resistance is in the states to this yeah. government. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have a few states which are electing non-BJP governments. And so you get some sense that there's regional opposition, but there's no yeah. national opposition. But I would make a distinction here, Akil, between uh, the political, uh, the struggle for governance and control of, of governance in that sense, the, the struggle for state power, whether it's at the regional or at the central level, and the more long-term yeah. moral yeah. and cultural struggle, which is deep inside the Samaj, which right. is neither done or undone by elections. I mean, of course, elections yeah. and the sure. toxicity that they throw up has an effect. Yeah. I'm not saying so. Samaj is ever immune from that. Yeah. But I'm pinning my hopes on uh, that 
innate energy from deep inside the society asserting itself. And so sort of in closing, my one request to you is what advice, what further advice would you give to those amazing young people who showed up and so non-violently uh, protected the constitution? Uh, how, do, how do we, what, what inner strengths should uh, people be cultivating if they are to walk that path of non-violence? No, it's very hard to say. I mean, it was such a tragedy that COVID came at this time and all that was, was brought to, to an end. Uh, I think we should be learning, trying to learn lessons from the farmer's struggles and its success. Um, I think we should be watching Kashmir very carefully. We should be watching these moves towards the, uh, you know, this destruction of, of uh, citizenship for one one twelfth of the population. Um, I don't think we should give up on the political and the organizational struggles that are needed. You know, I, I, I agree with you that there's the moral struggle and the, there's the whole resistance at the, on the cultural level. But I think these things go hand in hand. And, of course, and, of course. I didn't mean and, to imply that they don't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we shouldn't lose sight of, of, of of you know the search for for pluralism and love and and all that, but I I do think that it's very hard to to I mean I just don't see any solution. There's a schizophrenic situation. All the all the opposition is happening in the regional level. There's no national level opposition, and and it's a kind of schizophrenia in what you're calling the political or electoral field, and. Um, and and I I just uh, there's some political theorists who say, well maybe we should have much 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 more federal decentralization so that in the regions where there's not that much Hindutva feeling, uh, maybe you can get you know uh, a different kind of of pluralistic uh, uh, societies, maybe that's that's one way to think of it. The, but those are all very long-term things. I mean, we don't have that federal, highly federalized structure. Uh, how are we going to uh, to bring it about? I mean, these are not not easy things to to contemplate. But you know, like with everything else, there's no advice to give but to say you have to organize. You have to you have to mobilize. Yeah. And uh, and it's, it gets harder and harder. But but as you say, as as people as as people begin to to suffer, which they have in so many ways, uh, you know, through demonetization first, then through uh, then through this completely disgraceful uh, handling of the, of the COVID virus crisis, sickening. Uh, state failures in uh, everywhere, even including in the regional levels, uh, and uh, so, so I don't, I don't know, Rajni. I think th there's no advice to give except the the usual advice, which is there is no alternative to organizing and to mobilizing, and and uh, the little successes we've seen with the farmers and and very aborted success uh, with with the two winters ago with the with the youth and and the muslims uh, these are exemplary things which we have to learn from <laughs> thank you so much again very enjoyable to see you and to to talk